All right, welcome everyone. We're going to start promptly because there's a lot to talk about today and an hour to try to fit it all in. So uh, we're really pleased to see everyone joining today for a webinar on sexual health indicators and uh, data collection. I know it sounds like a really exciting topic. It is in fact a really exciting topic. Um, quickly, I want to introduce Action Canada. So we are uh, Action Canada for Sexual Health and Rights, a national progressive organization that is committed to advance sexual and reproductive health and rights in Canada and globally. I also want to introduce uh, our guest today, uh, Dr. Wendy Norman. She is a family physician and a researcher. She holds the Public Health Agency of Canada Chair in Family Planning, Public Health Research, and is an Associate Professor in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia. She is also an Honorary Associate Professor in the Faculty of Public Health and Policy at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in the UK, and she is in fact joining us from the UK today. Thank you, Wendy, for that. Um, in 2015, Dr. Norman was awarded the prestigious Guttmacher Derek Award for advancing reproductive health policy research. She has founded and leads the national collaboration that is Canadian Contraception and Abortion Research Team at the CART GRAC. And Dr. Norman and her team conducted Canada's first representative sample household interview sexual health survey in BC in 2015 and has convened a national team of experts to create a comprehensive sexual health survey for use throughout Canada. And this is what we're going to be talking about today. It's a very exciting project and one that is dear to Action Canada and one we, we want to see progress on. So it's exciting to see our partners joining us today to rally around this important issue. So a quick intro of the topic and why we're convening partners today. We are thrilled to have Dr. Norman with us to talk us through sexual health data collection because most countries around the world conduct regular surveillance to monitor the following important health issues. Sexually transmitted and bloodborne infection, involuntary sterilization, pregnancy intentions, contraception use, gender equity, men's sexual health, unmet needs for contraception, pregnancy outcomes, intimate partner violence and reproductive coercion, and then sustainable de developmental goal indicators. Currently, Canada does not measure key indicators of sexual and reproductive health and health equity. Many of us here have come up against this gap when trying to access necessary information to guide our programming, our advocacy, our policy making for the political people in the room, or even meeting our funders' requirements. The lack of surveillance means that we don't have what we need as a country to allow all of us a better understanding of some of the key factors shaping issues we work so hard on, be it gender-based violence prevention, HIV prevention and care, STBBI testing, treatment and prevention, abortion access, or sex ed. Exit is in fact a great example of what we are missing to truly move the needle on something that can have such a great impact on public health and social issues. We know at Action Canada from looking into all provincial and territorial sex ed curricula that they do not all offer the same content or have been updated at the same rate. For example, some of them offer some learning outcomes on consent and sexual violence, some don't. Some speaks to gender identity and sexual orientation, some don't. Some speak to abortion, some don't. At this point, even as we advocate for better and more comprehensive sex ed across the country, we don't have all we need to monitor and evaluate programming and continue to refine our approach. Similarly, in recent months, there's been extended media coverage on the spike of syphilis cases in Canada. This is one example where the lack of comprehensive information leaves us unable to interpret trends in, in diagnoses appropriately. We may have the numbers, but the explanations as to why they are fluctuating is hard to pin down. What we can do is offer our best educated guesses, relying on patchwork information, information about certain segment of the population, and that's it. This means we have to build entire programs and strategies without the support of helpful population level data. This type of national surveillance work is a key missing piece in the health promotion and advocacy work that we all do. 
This is why we're hosting today's webinar with Dr. Wendy Norman, who has been leading the charge in advocating for the implementation at a federal level of a Canadian sexual health survey. And we hope that after this call, we will all be working together towards making this a reality in Canada. So Dr. Norman, we can start right away with you because I want to make sure we have a lot of time um, to go through all of the information you have to present us today. One second. I'm, oop, I was having trouble with the slides. Here they are. So first of all, the first question I have for you is when we're talking about collecting uh, sexual and reproductive health indicators, what are we exactly talking about beyond uh, tracking STBBI rates? And then from that, why is this needed? So if this can get you started on this important topic. Great, uh, great to be here this afternoon, uh, Fred, and to speak with you and our panelists uh, across the country coming, um, uh, joining us on the webinar today. Um, I think this is a great topic and I'm so glad we have a chance to have a conversation about it. As you had mentioned, Canada hasn't been measuring all kinds of things we need to be able to make the kinds of policies, systems, and services available to equitably help people achieve uh, sexual and reproductive health. Uh, we know in Canada that there are grave disparities. We've actually received uh, uh, sanctions from the United Nations Human Rights Commissioner for the Committee Against the Discrimination of Women, noting that Canada has very inequitable access to a large number of contraception and abortion uh, uh, facilities and services and other sexual and reproductive health measures. One of the key difficulties we have in trying to address these disparities and these gaps is we aren't even measuring them. And we, we cannot fix the disparities and help people to have more equity when we aren't currently measuring where they are or what are the myriad determinants that are helping to address them. And as you were so interestingly pointing out, with the outbreaks for uh, syphilis and chlamydia and gonorrhea and the increasing rates of sexually transmitted and blood-borne infections, um, we have not been doing population-based prevalence uh, monitoring for these. We monitor those who come to be tested or those where we reach out to known risk groups and do testing, but we haven't looked at the general population. And I think this has left us guessing as to what are the determinants that are driving these increased rates that we're seeing and the, um, uh, the, the changes. So I, I think there's lots of good information on why we might need these pieces here. I think you have a slide coming up that, show, there we go, yep. Uh, so sexual health behaviors, uh, and experiences, the related social determinants, and of course the stigma, discrimination, violence, and coercion. Uh, on your next slide, I think there, um, we were looking at equity and at the differences uh, that we are unable currently to be able to monitor, to be able to report globally, to be able to see the changes made by uh, interventions that we um, introduce. Uh, and to be able to coordinate the work across sectors. All of these actions are managed in other fields outside of sexual and reproductive health um, by survey, national surveys that are conducted that are collecting these sorts of monitors. And in Canada, uh, there hasn't been yet a really good sexual and reproductive health survey. Many of you will know that the Canadian Community Health Survey for many years had about a nine minute section uh, about a nine question section, three minutes, um, that was administered um, some years, maybe alternate or every third year, um, uh, to be able to collect a, a minimum amount of sexual reproductive health questions. That changed in the 2015 iteration and since then to a one minute uh, section with uh, three to four questions. And so we uh, lost completely at that time the ability to measure uh, current pregnancy intentions, so we don't have a denominator for contraception uh, use. Um, there's lots of scope to be able to get better information. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how that can best be done and what are the global standards for that sort of work. Uh, we were going to bring up, and thank you for moving to this slide, uh, Fred, the, uh, the equity issue. And what we can see 
is that when families are able to time and space their pregnancies and achieve a full uh, sexual and reproductive health for their family, their children are less likely to be brought up in uh, an experience of intimate partner violence, less likely to have iterations uh, through generations uh, from those learned experiences at early ages. Uh, when uh, the children in the home uh, are not impacted by subsequent unintended pregnancies with uh, other children coming into the home, uh, these uh, children are more likely to be able to graduate high school and to be able to achieve their own economic dreams. Of course, the ability of the child bearer, the female in the household, to achieve her own education and uh, work goals and to be able to contribute economically and as a volunteer in our society is much higher when um, families are able to decide whether they want to have children and the spacing between them when they would want to be pregnant. Um, so these are not equitably distributed in Canada now, and we don't have good information on the determinants of these inequities, partly because we don't have representative sexual and reproductive health survey. So just an example from the um, uh, unmet needs for contraception field of why it's so important that we try to capture and measure the standard uh, indicators that are collected in countries all over the world. Thank you for bringing to life um, why this data is so important beyond just having rates of infections, for example, and to be able to dig truly into the stories behind them uh, and to see how that would impact policy programming and uh, political action on the topic. I'm wondering if we can move on to uh, you, Wendy, telling us if Canada is not measuring these sexual health indicators at this point, is that the case in many other countries? What is happening elsewhere in the world on this issue? Yes, that's a great question. I think it's important for um, people in Canada to understand that we are the anomaly in the world. Um, the World Health Organization currently is convening uh, leading experts from all around uh, the world to be able to look at the indicators they've been collecting on sexual and reproductive health and help them to more closely align between countries. And they've left Canada out of the discussions because Canada is recognized as the uh, one of the only countries in the world that does not measure sexual and reproductive health indicators. Um, over 90 countries are measured in the demographic health survey. Many countries like Canada are doing their own iterative surveys. So the United States, for example, uh, brought in the National Survey of Family Growth, looking at sexual and reproductive health indicators starting in 1977. They repeated it about uh, uh, once every uh, four or five years initially, and they found the data was so important uh, sorry, 1973, uh, to be able to found dozens of their policies upon uh, that they changed it to being a continuous survey starting about 2006. And they now uh, cut off about every two years, the 10,000 participants or so that they do in this door-to-door -door, uh, household survey, asking people about 80 minutes of questions on their sexual and reproductive health. And they have a very robust response rate um, and get excellent data that's been the basis for uh, uh, a large number of policies moving forward, helping to address inequities. Similarly, in the United Kingdom, they started in about 1990 uh, doing an iterative survey. They're now on their fourth iteration, uh, the National Survey of Sexual Attitudes and Lifestyles, or NATSAL, uh, collecting 15,000 household interviews. And uh, they also collect biological samples that allow them to test. Uh, these days, we could be collecting dried blood spot and uh, a urine filter dip that can allow us to test for six of our uh, sexually transmitted in, uh, infections and bloodborne illnesses um, at a population level to be able to understand what are the determinants in this um, uh, type of survey. Again, the National Survey of Sexual Attitudes and Lifestyles has a very robust response rate, and they um, uh, it's about a 40-minute survey. So compare this again to Canada's history, where we used to have 
uh, a three minute sexual health survey as part of our Canadian Community Health Survey, and it's gone now down to one minute. Um, clearly, we do not have the current uh, information that we need to be a basis for founding good policies, good programs, and good services to assist Canadians to an equitable chance to have realized their sexual and reproductive health goals. Wendy, would you mind going over again, what are the kind of questions, if they're talking for 80 minutes, what are the kind of topics they're covering, um, issues that they want to see included and in, that they have included in those surveys? Yeah, thanks for asking. But I think you've got a slide coming up on the, um, oh, but it's quite a ways down, I guess. Uh, so they're looking at a wide range of the components of sexual and reproductive health. They look at gender-based violence, sexual orientation, gender identity, the kinds of sexual behaviors that people are reporting, uh, and their social determinants of health that might play into uh, any reported inequities or um, uh, variations uh, for their experiences of sexual and reproductive health. Uh, additionally, they're asking about pregnancy-based experiences, about pregnancy intention, about the, um, uh, their experiences with contraception, their experiences with partners, with dating, with um, uh, relationships. And these factors are uh, produce the standard indicators that we need to be able to design policies uh, and uh, programs to support people to have uh, healthy sexual lives. And currently in Canada, this is not what is happening. Uh, well, we uh, have been collecting information on STIs, uh, sexually transmitted infections and bloodborne illnesses from those who come to get tested or where we have targeted testing, but we haven't been doing testing on a national level uh, where we're collecting from the general population to see what are the determinants and factors related to illnesses that, uh, to STIs and BBIs that might not otherwise be picked up. Um, uh, similarly, for other aspects, uh, pregnancy intention, violence, uh, female genital cutting, um, uh, other behaviors, we aren't able to pick up population prevalence or to understand where are the gaps and who's falling through those gaps uh, in Canada um, and interpret the trends to be able to address them. <laughs> And so next we will talk about one of your projects, so the BC Pilot Project, because it does offer us insight into how this could play out Canada-wide and, and what uh, your team has done to make it work and what were the results of that. So I'm going to move on to the slide on the BC Pilot. Wendy, could you describe a little bit this project, how it came to be and how it played out uh, in British Columbia? Uh, thanks so much for that, Fred. Yeah, so this started with the Chief Public Health Officer, Perry Kendall at that time, and now Bonnie Henry uh, in the province of British Columbia. Uh, and they were really looking at how to address unmet needs for contraception in the population and trying to understand whether a universal contraception subsidy would be an appropriate um, uh, policy for BC to consider. And they realized in order to do that, they would need to know what proportion of pregnancies that are currently happening are unintended, and what are the rates of contraceptive method use, and um, uh, what barriers do people have to be able to find the contraception that they would want if they are currently not intending pregnancy. And none of these uh, indicators are being captured in Canada, although they are captured, as we saw, in more than 100 countries around the world as standard indicators. Um, so... We applied to CIHR and received funding to run a research project through the uh, province where we worked with the people of the United States uh, National Survey of Family Growth and with the developers in the UK of the Nat South Survey, the National Survey of Sexual Attitudes and Lifestyles, to bring gold standard. And we uh, took samples from uh, Ireland and France and Australia and New Zealand from eight instruments around the world to bring gold standard validated questions into a questionnaire that was about a 30 minute questionnaire. And we traveled throughout British Columbia and did representative population based sampling in all areas, um, asking people as we knocked at their doors, 
if we could ask them about their sexual health. And uh, as you can see, we had a 75% uh, response rate for, among the eligible people that we met. They w were happy to tell us what were the difficulties they were having and what were their challenges. Um, and so we were able to collect then the first ever representative indicators uh, in BC for this pilot and to show that it would be very feasible to be able to scale up and do a national version. I'm curious to know when you train the team that so you're talking about door knocking to go around uh, certain barriers that are posed if we only do a survey on computers or by phone. Um, did you have to train your team specifically to be able to ask those questions in a way that yielded that that level of response or how did that go? Um, I think our, our team were uh, trained in ways that we learned were standard from the other um, surveys that are conducted around the world. We were able, because there are so many countries doing this successfully, to gather the best practices and to, to instill the best training. We had 14 uh, pairs of surveyors that were going out for about a year around the province to collect these interviews. Um, and uh, they had a training process before they went out to, uh, to be able to do the interviews. Um, I think that's what you're asking. Yeah, and it seems like it was successful uh, in, in yielding a, a high response rate. That's why I was curious about the process around that. That's, that's great. Well, also, you know, our government um, uh, went into the local media and our research team to explain why we were doing the survey. And we explained mm -hmm. to the people of BC and to the people within the small towns and all across the, uh, the province that uh, the government really wanted to be able to address their needs equitably and they needed their information so that we could understand where the needs were and what programs and services might still be needed. And so we found in many of the rural areas the uh, response rate was upwards of 90%. So the people were very keen to participate when they knew that they indicators were going to be used for making policy-based decisions. It's incredible. Um, and this has resulted in a, in a report that is used by the government at this point? Yes, uh, I see you've got the slide on the development. I think we talked about most of these pieces. We um, mm -hmm. had a great response rate through all of the different areas of BC. Maybe next slide. Yeah. Uh, oh, this was a piece you'd asked me. Why would you go door to door when you could do telephone interviews or ask people to uh, respond on the internet? Well, the interesting thing is that um, when you do an internet-based response survey, you typically will lose the bottom 10% of those who have the most difficult social determinants of health, those in the lowest socioeconomic groups, um, and facing the most barriers and challenges to achieve their own general health. Uh, we were very successful in going door to door uh, and oversampling for disadvantaged uh, groups to be able to get a robust capture of those people falling between the gaps and those who had the most needs uh, to be able to help inform and guide policies. Uh, so we were very pleased with the robust nature of the data that's collected when you do invest to go door to door and mm -hmm. take the time to find out directly from people uh, what their circumstances are and not to leave some people behind because they don't have the minutes on their telephone to spend answering a survey or access to a computer where they can confidentially do entry of private information rather than uh, what you might put in a public setting. That's great. And I wonder, we, uh, in speaking about this topic with many of our partners, partners in the Northern Territories were, uh, were a little worried that um, usually stats are not considered to be significant enough for them to be included in a kind of survey like that. Would, would there be measures put in place to ensure that data collected in the Northern part of the country or in more rural and remote areas would still be included in, in a Canadian-wide survey? Oh, that's a great question, Fred, and I think that will um, come through as uh, we're able to be working with the Public Health Agency and with Statistics Canada on uh, what are the most appropriate mechanisms. Uh, what I can say from our BC pilot is that we were able to get very robust capture in our northern areas and our uh, remote areas. 
uh, so that people were able to um, respond. And as you can see on this slide showing the uh, major inequities uh, that were captured, um, we were able to find that those in rural areas didn't have the same support and services that those in urban areas did to be able to meet their own sexual and reproductive health needs, and that this had an exacerbating effect with compounding their difficulties with uh, social determinants. Next slide. So this was the BC pilot project. This happened in 2015. And now we're uh, wondering if this can be scaled up to a national level. Can you speak to the possibility of seeing what happened in BC being scaled up uh, to a national, uh, to, to become a Canadian national sexual health survey? Uh, so certainly our group has been working with governments across the country and um, with people within the public health agency and uh, the Ministry of Health in BC. Uh, we have um, academic leaders from eight universities and several of the uh, public health areas who've been contributing to refining a, a proposed instrument for the national survey. I think your next slide will show some of the different areas, uh, our team from all across the country. Uh, next slide, uh, some of the different areas. So the first part of the survey would be asking not uh, questions that aren't as stigmatized, um, very sort of general introductory basic uh, questions, uh, where the, the interviewer is asking these questions of the uh, respondent at their household in a confidential uh, setting, and uh, with the contraception history looking at um, sort of the past 12 to 18 months of use of different methods, the number of different partners, the pregnancy and uh, sexual activity history. And then the next slide, the most of the questions then are done as a, a self-entry onto the tablet by the respondent in their home. So the interviewer is still there, but they can't see the answers that the respondent is putting into the computer. And the interviewer is uh, lets the respondent know quite clearly beforehand that that interviewer will never know what the exact answers were that this uh, person puts in so that their confidentiality is ensured, the answers go right uh, directly to um, a protected server in, uh, uh, behind firewalls and um, uh, to a secure location. Uh, so that we're able to pick up very important information on um, uh, more stigmatized behaviors and a full range of sexual and reproductive health uh, behaviors that have been experienced with, uh, the, uh, with the person. The interesting thing, I think, is that when you compare the responses that you get when people have entered their own answers on the internet or those that you get when they've spoken to an interviewer and then they do the self-entry here, we have more reliable, robust data on these stigmatized behaviors, uh, abortion, stillbirth, um, births that happen before marriage, um, uh, sexually transmitted infection, substance use. More uh, um, accurate information is coming out in this method than any other method you can uh, uh, bring to collecting this sort of data from people. And for, finally, then, the survey ends on uh, next page by looking at uh, uh, the interviewer asking questions again on access information and general demographics um, and collecting the personal health number to allow linkages to other uh, databases should that person be interested to give that information. Um, one question um, before before we move on to uh, the political aspect of this conversation, I was wondering, can you speak to, again, you mentioned that some of those questions were built from best practice, from other surveys that exist everywhere. We have in the room today partners from mul a multitude of sectors, so gender-based prevention, uh, SBBI, uh, HIV sector, um, violence against women, et cetera. How, are, like, how are those questions designed? Is there, um, how is there an effort made to ensure that we're capturing the most comprehensive version of what a sexual health survey could be in Canada? Thank you, uh, Fred. So I think this is very important, and it was something that was a key uh, concern of uh, uh, Perry Kendall, our 
Central Officer of Health in BC and our academic partners in this work. Um, uh, I, uh, I've been co coordinating with and uh, uh, invited to participate in the activities of the technical working group of the WHO. Um, and we have uh, access to gold standard validated questions that have been fielded in some cases for decades in national surveys in countries like Canada, uh, so that we have very uh, strong, reliable uh, instrument to be able to collect the information that will be of most use to policymakers. And the work of the committee that I'm um, uh, lucky enough to collaborate with now with the WHO is bringing uh, indicators from uh, many different settings and countries and uh, making as much equivalence as we can so that from one country to another we'll be able to compare the kinds of indicators we're collecting to best understand how to meet the needs of our respective populations. I'm not sure, Fred, if that's exactly what you're asking. I was curious to see exactly how... Um how we get to the most comprehensive version of a sexual health survey possible is, and it seems like the team is dedicated to that. I wonder in BC, how has it played out in terms of different sectors ability to use the information that was gathered by the survey? So is it only policymakers and politicians that are able to use this information or is it available for different sectors to, um, to access as they, prepare their work, strategize for around their own issues. Right. Uh, so um, as you saw, we had started out with a particular policy question, should contraception be free, that drove the BC uh, development of this pilot and the fielding of it. And so our first work uh, in the three years since the uh, survey information has been finalized has been with the government to be able to model um, um, for them the costs they currently incur to manage unintended pregnancies and how those costs would be different if they were providing free contraception for all instead of paying to manage unintended pregnancies um, uh, given the uh, current uh, use of contraceptive methods and the use that people would have if they didn't have to pay for them. Um, and uh, your question was really about whether the information will be available for other sectors. Yes, we're moving on now to the academic papers. Our modeling for the government is, uh, is coming to a close. The government has our final reports now uh, on the, co the cost effectiveness of contraception. So in sharing the rest of the results in academic papers, they will be available widely for other sectors. Um, Interestingly, our work in BC was very similar to the work that's been published in um, the uh, United States and in the UK, looking at cost effectiveness of conception in the US. They found that a couple of uh, three years after the Affordable Care Act was implemented, offering free contraception and contraception counseling, that they saved $7.04 for every dollar invested in contraceptive counseling and pre contraception. Uh, in the UK, their report of 2018 from Public Health England similarly found that they save nine, dollars, nine pounds for every pound they invest in sexual and reproductive health uh, um, a, a care, including free contraception. And so, these policies were made possible um, because of all the information that is gathered through sexual health surveys. Well, I think it comes back to what we were saying in the beginning. If you don't measure it, you can't fix it. It's a, a long-standing principle of uh, public health, and we are not measuring sexual and reproductive health indicators. So Canada is struggling to address our inequities. That is a, a very strong point uh, to make to continue our work towards seeing this happen in Canada. Thank you. We are getting a, a question here from an attendee, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask it for you, Wendy. So does demographics include robust ethno-racial self-identification, so I Indigenous peoples and peoples of color, to make visible related or color-coded inequities and disparities? So is it possible to see the racial and cultural elements of the inequities that are surfaced by such surveys? Ah, great question. Um, maybe I was thinking there might be 
more interesting slides we could go back to uh, as our visual for this at some point. Um, so we are we're working with Statistics Canada and the Public Health Agency to understand the most appropriate um, uh, social demographic characteristics that they would want to link with the health behaviors and self-reported um, gender-based, <coughs> excuse me, gender-based violence, others. Uh, at the moment, the survey is looking at the current self-reported ethnic and um, uh, cultural backgrounds that are captured within the uh, other surveys that the, are fielded nationally by Statistics Canada and using analogous uh, or, or uh, the same questions to allow uh, for comparison between surveys. Uh, but part of the process, of course, of uh, developing and fielding a survey such as this would be uh, the opportunity for stakeholder consultation to be able to examine if there are uh, pieces that we are not capturing that should be captured. So there would be a consultation piece to implementing a Canadian sexual health survey, just confirming the process around... Um, that's the proposal at the current time. Okay. Thank you. So... Um, moving on to uh, the next section of our talk between uh, Wendy and my colleague Sarah, who is also on the, on the webinar today. So Sarah is the director of our government relations and campaigns team and is here with us to talk about uh, or to, to discuss with Wendy before we move on to questions from the attendees. So the next piece of our webinar was about what can we do about this? So the the case is compelling when it comes to the fact that in Canada, we need to measure sexual health indicators. It is not happening right now. We want to see this happen. This is necessary for uh, better policy, uh, better advocacy, better programming, better services on the ground, and, and, and then with the result of better health outcomes and better health equity. Um, so... Wendy and Sarah, what, do you, what action is needed to see this happen? Who are the key decision maker and what can we do as a collective here on this call um, to see this come to fruition in Canada? Wendy, would you like to jump in first uh, based on your experience in DC? Uh, I, I think I'm happy to uh, go with, um, follow your lead on this, uh, Sarah. I've had a lot sure. of chance to talk and to say what, what I think we really need. Okay. And, well, thank you. Yeah, feel free to jump in. And I think there's so much um, that we can learn from the BC experience that builds such a robust case for why we need this um, at a national level. Um, building on the fact that, of course, every other country, it seems, is doing this and Canada is now falling behind. Um, so thank you so much to you both for setting the stage in such a compelling way for us to take action, because I think we are in a unique moment of opportunity now, um, given the political stars that have aligned in the last couple of weeks, for us to actually make this happen. And I think... Um, I'm, I'm excited to launch into the Q&A because I really think we can uncover some of the very practical, tangible ways that this kind of data, having access to this data over a long period of time and collected in a regular and consistent manner, um, could unlock many of the issues that we face on a daily basis within our organizations across the country. So in terms of the political opportunity, I wanted to touch on a few things that I think from our perspective um, make for the right moment to take action. First of all, um, the Liberal government that's been re-elected has demonstrated a strong commitment to evidence and data um, and research. And it has you know, consistently invested in those areas for the last couple of years. So I think it's, it's, you know, there's opportunity before us for them to uh, stay on that trajectory of investment with a little bit of push from us. Um, there's also the opportunity that comes with a new Minister of Health that will likely be um, in place come tomorrow or announced tomorrow. And so we're waiting with bated breath to see who that is uh, and be able to then take the mandate letter that's issued to that person by the Prime Minister um, and, and create opportunities within that political direction 
also by the liberal platform that was uh, campaigned on during the election to be able to look for entry points to really take advantage of the opportunity that's presented there. Um, of course, there's also the launch of whatever becomes of a national pharmacare strategy. And I think there we'll be having more discussions at a federal level about what that looks like, how it is truly universal, how it fills the, the gaps. And Action Canada has been doing a lot of work taking a sexual and, and reproductive rights lens to the pharmacare conversation, which again creates entry point for us to be having conversations about sexual and reproductive health and how in order to have a robust pharmacare strategy, we need the evidence and the data and the research behind it to be able to fill those gaps. Um, there's the other issue that's quite interesting, unique before us of a minority parliament and the role that opposition parties can play in a minority government to hold the, um, the, the majority party to account in terms of its commitments. And so I think um, not only can we see the Liberal Party and the cabinet ministers as uh, levers to influence change in the next couple of years, but also uh, opposition leaders and, and opposition members um, who can, uh, you know, weigh in in a more powerful way in the legislature, certainly. And of course, there's the Senate now that is more and more interesting um, as a, a quote-unquote accountability function um, that we can use at our disposal as well here in Ottawa. And finally, the other the moment of opportunity or context of opportunity that I wanted to mention is that the federal government taking leadership role on data collection um, serves to uh, support provinces in developing better um, policy and delivering better programs that ultimately results in cost savings, as Wendy mentioned. And so uh, by taking on this research piece, this data collection piece, they're ultimately doing the provinces a huge solid in a, in a particular political moment when um, they need to be um, favoring um, uh, provincial and territorial uh, context right now. Um, so those would, would be the political stars that I see in alignment right now. And before moving on to, uh, Wendy, your thoughts on all of this, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the strategy that Action Canada has been thinking about vis-a-vis -vis this um, initiative. So we really hope that this is a moment for us to come together as a community across uh, stakeholder groups. So not just looking at the sexual and reproductive rights movement, but looking at the violence against women um, movement, looking at youth uh, engagement, uh, you know, uh, movements, looking at LGBTQ groups, looking at um, public health agencies, all of these different stakeholders coming together to um, deliver a common message to federal leaders and federal departments. And so so we're hoping after this webinar that um, we can send you all a joint letter for you to sign on that would clearly articulate what we're asking for across sectors and why we're asking for it, very much in line with the information that's been presented here today. Um, and then from there, looking to work with you together to engage the media, engage opposition members, engage opposition parties um, towards general awareness raising about why this issue matters and why we need federal action now. And then just touching on a question that was raised in the Q&A box, and um, perhaps, uh, Dr. Norman, you can speak more to this as well. Uh, I, I'll just read it a little bit. But um, it is, how do we encourage Canada to meet the standard of our international peers by tracking these critical indicators? So part of our political strategy is really is really about that, exactly. Um, and if all else fails, we're prepared to go back to the UN and secure further recommendations to Canada uh, that demonstrate how Canada is failing to meet its human rights obligations by failing to, to collect this critical information. Because um, as has been said so many times on this call already, if you can't measure it, you cannot build solid and sound policy on it. Um, and, and it actually becomes cost ineffective to be delivering programs that aren't rooted in a strong data uh, or a, a base of evidence. So um, perhaps with all of that laid out, I'll talk, turn it back to Wendy to offer insights about the political opportunity and strategy that we have. Um, and I'm keen to hear, yeah, if you, you have reflections on that at the federal level, also building on your experience in British Columbia where we've seen so much progress. Right. Thanks, Sarah. Well, I think that's really well put. Essentially, we all need to speak to the closest politician we can find and those within 
the Ministry of Health and the Public Health Agency to express the urgent need that we see and define uh, to be able to capture these indicators so that we can do the jobs that we all want to do uh, in addressing the equitable ability of people to have uh, a, a full definition of sexual, realize their full definition of sexual and reproductive health in their lives and the lives of their families. Um, I think uh, I'm very interested to uh, address any questions that are coming up from the group. And I know you had explained that there's a uh, Q&A box that everybody should have at the bottom of their screen. Please feel free to put in your questions. Our moderators will bring them forward so that we can add to the discussion. Um, I think that in my, from my perspective, this is very possible. This is something we are so close to. And we need the um, movement of people saying, yes, this is important to us. We think sexual and reproductive health is health and that's important in Canada uh, so that when we can uh, collect the information that we need to collect we'll be better able to do our jobs to assist those who need the most help in our society rather than not being able to understand where they are or what their needs are. So I invite anyone on the line um, to ask their questions, if you have any for Dr. Norman or for Sarah about political strategy, uh, or if you have any, um, any comments about the content you've heard today. We will share slides uh, from the presentation and we will add any information um, to those slides that could be useful for people to make their mind uh, about this, this important issue that we, uh, we are urging you to rally around with us. Um, and so if there is anyone who has... There's a question here, Fred. It's how do you see Statistics Canada's role in sexual and reproductive health data? Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, Wendy, would you take that on? Uh, yes, uh, sorry, my uh, um, transmission froze a bit across the Atlantic there for a moment. Um, so uh, my, I think uh, from my perspective, it would be ideal if this were a uh, survey that was um, uh, managed and commissioned by the Ministry of Health and that Statistics Canada were implementing and fielding it. Um, uh, Statistics, Statistics Canada is our national um, body that is expert in the area of fielding household surveys. And uh, they know how to do the development, how to do the testing, how to get the response rates, how to get it out there. But I do think that a lot of the content and the action on the results of uh, this is, would be housed within the Ministry of Health, within Health Canada, within particularly within the Public Health Agency of Canada. We have gotten a question um, here about what role can people play within provinces when they access their provincial governments and representative? Also, what role did civil society play on the ground in BC in galvanizing momentum around the BC pilot project? Uh, so maybe I'll leave the first part to Sarah and I'll speak on the second part. So Sarah, the question for you was, what role can people play within provinces when they access their provincial governments and representative? I think that's a really great question. Um, I think that there are many on the call uh, who do provincial level advocacy and I'd invite them to hop on with their suggestions as well. Um, I think that, um, you know, there are different opportunities depending on political context. And of course, we, we know we are entering a moment with an increasingly um, conservative leading um, set of provincial governments across the country, which makes engaging them quite difficult. Um, however, we're seeing the backlash to Bill 207 in Alberta as an encouraging kind of example of the level of provincial advocacy that can be undertaken. So 
engaging opposition members, engaging the media, engaging diverse stakeholder groups like Friends of Medicare, um, Medical Students for Choice, uh, public health, um, uh, you know, um, community health centers, um, nurses associations, uh, professional associations across the health sector. These are all groups that I think need to be engaged in this particular conversation and can be incredibly um, helpful in having uh, conversations within the legislative context. Um, there are also moments where we can, um, you know, engage traditional uh, parliamentary mechanisms like committee hearings, uh, order paper questions, private members' bills, those types of things to spur um, conversation and action. And then there's the good old-fashioned protests on the Hill uh, or on the steps of the legislature. So if there are folks on the call who are interested in spurring this type of conversation at provincial and territorial level, please let us know. Um, uh, but uh, certainly we're aiming uh, to have the feds take up the, uh, a leadership role in, in seeing this through um, because we've seen what happens when it's left to provinces to do it piecemeal. And I would just like to add to what Sarah is saying to, to re reiterate, uh, sometimes it feels overwhelming to hear about a list, a laundry list of things that can be done within provinces or the kind of advocacy we can, we can partake in. Um, act one of Action Canada's role that we, we play and we can play with many actors on the ground in provinces is a holder of information and so we are gathering a lot of, of information on this particular issue and then are happy to support individual groups or uh, organizations that wish to know more about this issue after this call or wish to organize um, in their own community to to further this uh, in their own region and so please contact us this is a role that we can play for you if this feels uh, difficult to find kind of a point of entry so uh, to have a group to brainstorm with is, is always helpful. And so please do reach out to Action Canada if this is of interest. And then, Wendy, the second piece of that question was, what role did civil society play on the ground in BC to get in galvanizing momentum around the BC pilot project? Right. Well, that's a great question as well. And uh, I suppose from the from the start, it was um, coming from a, a, a place of organization. The BC Women's Hospital um, has for many years convened a uh, provincial stakeholder group of all interested in civil society, um, healthcare providers, patients, options for sexual health, the Action Canada for Sexual Health partner in BC that runs about 60 clinics. Uh, in holding a, a contraception and abortion in BC provincial meeting, um, the government uh, is uh, has many um, senior decision makers who attend. Many from BC Women's Hospital and the leadership through the provincial health authority on women's health and uh, sexual health are <clears throat> participants in these meetings. And it was at this meeting that the consensus came forward that we need to measure sexual health indicators in BC. So when the academic group then um, worked with government to develop an uh, application for CIHR, it was clear to CIHR that we had the engagement of society and government and the academics to be able to bring the pieces together so that evidence that was collected was more likely to be used for policy change, for system change, to make services better, and to help those at the interface between people in need and those who can give them care to be able to best meet the needs equitably of people across the province. Uh, Fred, I'm not sure if that's uh, what your questioner had felt they were asking. This is a, a great response, and I, I do want to add that, Wendy, you and your team are always champions of, um, of people being able to use research to advance better policy. I have seen it in action uh, multiple times. I have seen policy change come from the research that you lead, and so this is an incredible service that you offer to all the people on the line here who work in sexual rights and advancing them across sectors. 
Um, so thank you for that. I will and move thank on. Thank you for your participation in so many of our meetings. <laughs> Um, so we have a couple more questions. So one is, uh, I will actually take, so in sharing the slides, could you please provide some additional information regarding which provinces include different or diverse topics within their sex ed curricula? So I'm going to take this opportunity to say that we will have a report that will compile that information that will be coming out in the spring um, as we convene partners for uh, to discuss um, advancing the issue of, of equitable access to high quality sex ed in Canada. And so, yes, this will be information that will be widely available in the spring. And uh, we are always happy to strike conversation with our partners one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. If you have more questions and want to discuss this issue, we already have quite a bit on our website that can be accessed looking at the state of sex ed in Canada generally. And we will continue to put out as much information as we can on the, on the matter as we continue our own uh, research on the topic. So thank you for that great question. And there's another one who is, given that Indigenous peoples and people of colour make up 25% of Canada's population, has there been any thought to having a multiple language dim dimension to the shared education and advocacy effort? I can speak a little bit for that for our BC pilot. We did um, a field the pilot uh, in the uh, first languages of those uh, in the province where more than 5% of the province spoke that as their first language in their home. So in uh, the case of British Columbia, that meant that uh, the survey was fielded in English, um, Mandarin, uh, Cantonese, and Punjabi. Um, and in other provinces, of course, that language mix would be very different. Um, but looking at trying to make the survey the most accessible it could be uh, for uh, all of the people uh, to, again, we don't, we want a way to measure where are the gaps and who might be falling through the cracks. And you can't do that if you aren't speaking the language that somebody needs to speak. Uh, Fred, I think I answered just part of the question though. I think there is a piece on the education and advocacy component um, in terms of how do we secure this as a, a movement uh, collectively. And I think um, it's something that we at Action Canada are keen to further explore about how we can um, even have this webinar in more languages and make it more accessible to different folks um, representing different um, organizations and individuals. So uh, I think we should take that on board as something to, to think about more and, and reflect on. And we'd be very keen to hear thoughts on how you, um, Michael, have done that or other organizations have done that because um, that's certainly an area for us to improve um, in our own federal advocacy. And Fred, I don't know if you have anything to add. Just a brief mention to say, as I as I mentioned um, during the earlier conversation, we have also uh, hosted calls with many of our partners across the country uh, to discuss this idea and this topic and to assess the interest in supporting um, advocacy around uh, having a Canadian sexual health survey and some of our partners had had uh, the same concerns, especially in the north uh, in, in the territories. And so uh, these are questions that we definitely mean to bring forward in terms of ensuring that if there is a, a Canadian sexual health survey that is implemented, that it will reflect uh, the reality of, of people everywhere in Canada, of all peoples, and in a way that is um, inclusive. And so absolutely this is on our minds and reaching directly to our partners across Canada is one way that we are um, trying to get that information so in our advocacy we can be as expansive as possible in terms of our reach and in terms of the issues that we include um, in our materials. So thank you for the, this great question. Is there any other questions? We are Coming up to the very end of the webinar, we want to respect people's time. We had said one hour, the lunch hour. So thank you for joining us. But if there's one quick question, we have a couple minutes to answer. Maybe while folks are thinking about their question or typing their question, we could just flag that we'd be more than happy to um, answer questions by email or have follow-up conversations, and, and we can facilitate introductions, of course, with uh, Wendy and, and others. Um, 
And just to say also that if you registered for this webinar, you can expect a joint letter uh, for your organizational sign-on consideration to go to federal leaders um, in the coming weeks on this. So we're really hoping that um, you, now that you are probably jazzed about this and thinking, why don't we have this and we need to do something, can then um, talk to your friends and family about it, talk to your colleagues, and, and hopefully socialize that joint letter as much as possible so that we can... Um, can really make this a reality in the next couple of months. I'm not seeing any questions coming in, so I'm gonna take the last couple minutes to thank Wendy for joining us all the way from the UK. Oh, there's one question. What role do you see the Public Health Agency of Canada playing in this work? So Wendy, perhaps you can, you can speak to that. Um, what do you think would be the role of uh, PHAC in advancing um, a Canadian National Sexual Health Survey? Well, my own dream would be that this is uh, right straight in the lane of the Public Health Agency of Canada, that <clears throat> their mandate to be able to ensure equitable health across the country uh, and to be able to monitor and develop prevention programs. This is so in line with being able to support our populations to equitably experience sexual and reproductive health in the full WHO definition of the terms. Uh, I think this is part of why we have a public health agency of Canada. It's a young agency. They started with the, the, the SARS crisis not that long ago. Uh, but I think that this is very clearly something in the straight main line uh, of the public health agency, not only with their ST and BPI uh, surveillance and uh, prevention strategies be enhanced, but so much more uh, about the sexual and reproductive health could be addressed uh, should they be able to take on. Uh, the understanding and the management of uh, addressing the indicators collected from such a survey. Thank you for your answer. All right, so this concludes our webinar on um, good data, good health, good policy. Uh, thank you so much, <clears throat> everyone, for joining us. Thank you, uh, Wendy, for joining us all the way from the UK to share your knowledge on this important issue. And thank you, Sarah, for outlining uh, what can be done for all of us to come together to see this happen um, as soon as possible and as, in a way that will ensure that we promote everyone's health in a way that is equitable. Uh, and so be sure that you will hear from us soon um, so you can join us in our efforts to, uh, to make this a reality in Canada. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, Fred, for great sharing. Yeah, great job. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>